Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys are enjoying uh, the beautiful winter weather outside. For anyone who does not know me, my name is Winston Brady, and I'm the director of Thales Press. And it's my joy to introduce our host for today's webinar, Mr. Zachary Palmer, who is a history teacher and a trivium teacher at Thales Academy Apex. Uh, Mr. Palmer is uh, going to walk us through ways and strategies of encouraging student, students to develop good writing habits. Uh, Mr. Palmer is uh, originally from Wisconsin, um, and he's joined our faculty this year uh, teaching history at the Apex campus. So I'll turn it over to him. Uh, just to let you guys know, though, we will uh, record this webinar, and we do post those recordings on our Thales Press YouTube channel. Uh, so that's at Thales Press. Um, if there's anything that you guys need, uh, feel free to type into the Q&A, into the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring that as the webinar goes on. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you so much for Mr. Palmer for uh, putting together this presentation for us uh, just to uh, help us develop some tools and strategies to help our students become better writers. So, Mr. Zachary Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Brady, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Zachary Palmer. Um, as Mr. Brady said, I'm a history teacher um, here at Thales Academy Apex. Uh, this is my fourth year teaching. I taught for three years um, up in Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah, so the topic of our of the presentation today is writing is rewriting, and my goal is to go over and address um, some of the some of the issue, well, I guess, like, how can we as teachers help our students become better writers? And to get us started, I wanted to start with a true story of why um, I'm here. Um, so when I was in high school, um, I remember very vividly that my mother would always insist on uh, reading my essays before I would turn them in to my teachers. And, you know, being the typical, you know, young student, um, I thought that my essays would be very good and I would show my mom them and she would always provide me with constructive criticism. But I remember this one time it was in a British literature class and I was supposed to write an essay on Gulliver's travels. And I gave my mom my rough draft and she came back uh, about an hour or so later with it. And I noticed that there was nothing written on it. There was no red ink. There was no comments, no nothing, which was not like her at all. And I remember her looking at me with, you know, all the love and joy in the world. And she said, you know, in order for me to get through this paper, I would have to consume at least one to two glasses of wine. <laughs> and I, at the moment, I thought like, oh, like, ouch, you know, it, it, it hurt. And at first, you know, I thought she's got, you know, it can't possibly be that bad. But I realized after that fact that she actually was right. And one of the things she would teach me over and over and over again was, in, you know, how can you ever expect to become a good writer if you don't practice? And I, I, I've really sort of internalized that ever since then. I had many teachers since my mom, my first teacher, you know, telling me that as well. Uh, another quote that I thought um, also really represents kind of what we're gonna be talking about today is a quote by Mark Twain in which he says that the difference between the almost right word and the right word is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. So as teachers, we don't want to settle for our students merely being lightning bugs, right? We look out on the back porch and there's some little glints, you know, off in the distance and, you know, it's, they're beautiful, but what we really want our students to achieve is to look up, right there, to see their papers like, the lightning bolts in the sky, right? To feel that, right? In the Greco tradition, like right? the power of Zeus, like just really good rhetoric and logic. And that's ultimately our goal. So with that being said, I wanted to say just a couple of things about why writing is important. Um, I think it's very important for all of us as teachers in the humanities to remember that yes, we teach, we teach literature, we teach history, we teach philosophy, we teach trivium but we're also fundamentally teachers of writing. And writing, and I still believe, is one of the most important skills, if not the most important skill, that anyone can learn while they're in school, because it is one of the two forms of human communication alongside speech. Um, writing is a synthesis of both, of both um, our, 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 our logical reasoning um, along with putting, instilling speech on text. So we can not only transmit knowledge, we can also 
um, record information and knowledge for later generations. But in the process of writing, uh, writing itself is a very difficult process. And as we practice, we are acquiring mental discipline and refinement. And one of the one of the ways that's always stuck with me about how we can visualize writing is that writing in a way can be like a mirror of the mind. And what that means is if we've as teachers, we've all seen the difference between a really subpar paper and a paper that just knocks it out of the park. Like we're talking really high quality. And that can suggest that while one of the students has achieved a great degree of uh, rhetorical and logical reasoning, the other is really struggling with some of the basics. So to, I wanna give an illustration of this um, with two different examples of writing, um, how, we can, how we can see this play out. So both of these passages are coming from two writers of two completely different levels of experience. And they're both have to deal with establishing a scene is what they have in common. So the first example um, goes like this. It was such a beautiful night. The bright moonlight illuminated the sky and the thick clouds floated leisurely by just above the silhouette of tall, majestic trees. And I was viewing it all from the front row seat of the bullet hole in my car trunk. So, <laughs> so it's clear from this that the, the, the writer is trying to, right, they're building some suspense, they're setting a scene, but the intended effect, which is supposed to be shock and awe, is undermined by this almost comical last phrase. Um, and, and it just, it's, you can tell that the writer is not as experienced, it's, it's unrefined. Versus the second example, which comes from a Pulitzer Prize winner, um, which this one says, four stories up, the Austrians clap another shell into the smoking breach of the 88 and double check the traverse and clamp their ears as the gun discharges. But down here, Werner hears only the radio voices of his childhood. The goddess of history looked down to earth. Only through the hottest fires can purification be achieved. He sees a forest of dying sunflowers, and he sees a flock of blackbirds explode out of a tree. So here we have this just, I think, beautiful example of a writer painting a picture out of a horrifying backdrop, which is the, the Nazi invasion of France during World War II. And rather than just tell us that that's what's going on, the writer shows us uh, versus the first example, which tells us a bunch of things, but doesn't really show us much of anything of significance. So this is something that I think we really want to strive. Like I think we want all of our students to be able to get to the level where they are showing and not telling. So how exactly do we get there? Um, I've spoken with many teachers and, that are much older than me. Um, ever since I was in high school, I was, I've been trying to figure out like, how do you get better? How do you get better? How do you become a better writer? And reflecting on it, I was able to sort of condense it all down to three laws. Um, the first is that students must read widely and deeply. The second is that students need to study the masters and their unique styles. And also students need to write often under the guidance of an experienced teacher and writer. Um, one of my professors, when I was attending Hillsdale, uh, Dr. Gamble would say, there's no other way. We have, these three things have to be true. And the, you know, if you're, if you're studying these, you'll notice that two of them don't even have anything to do with writing whatsoever. And that's because the fun, the prerequisite to writing well is our students need to be reading a wide variety of literature. So if we take that first law, students are not going to become excellent writers just by reading young adult novels or uh, as my <laughs> as I like to read when I was a kid, Geronimo Stilton or something. Right. It's it's entertaining, but it's not it's not of the level and quality that we would like our students to achieve. That's why they need to be studying the, uh, the, the critical experts, right? The, 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 the writers that um, experts in the fields of literature, philosophy, and history have pointed to and said, we need to be reading these people. Because 
what students can then understand is that writing is more of an art than it is a science, that diff writers have different ways of approaching their subject matters, and there is value in, in many of them. Just like Ernest Hemingway's approach in A Farewell to Arms, he has these very short, pithy sentences, which at first can be abrasive, but then you realize there is some artistry and beauty in that. But then finally, students need to write. Just as we can't, you can't learn how to play the piano without practicing the piano, we can't expect students to become good writers if they're not actually writing. And that needs to be under some guidance of somebody who knows what they're doing. So someone might say, okay, I understand that. I get that we're trying to simplify things, but why hasn't this been working? Um, it's no surprise that in today's day and age of America, we are experiencing greater issues with student illiteracy. Um, that more, I mean, more and more educators and teachers are pointing out that there is a growing crisis of students who are not reading at grade level and they're not writing at grade level. And there's a whole, there probably is a whole bunch of reasons for this that we don't have time to get into, but. One of them that I would suggest is I think that we've been trying to teach writing the wrong way. Um, so in the education world, many of us are probably familiar with the difference between two types of assessment. The first is called a summative assessment. It's the type of test that we're mo all of us are pretty much familiar with. A summative assessment is an assessment of learning. Okay, so it's something like a midterm or a final exam, a comprehensive exam, or the typical paper that humanities teachers assign students in class. So we read, we assign 1984, students read 1984, hopefully, and then they write a paper on 1984, okay? So what that paper is doing is we are then seeing, did the students read the book? Do they understand the book and what George Orwell is trying to say? Now, there are very good reasons for why we as teachers use summative assessments. On the one hand, for the positives, right, it's a measurement tool. We can tell, are students learning the material or are they not? We can also use summative assessments to identify, are there gaps in our curriculum or are there gaps in student knowledge? Do we need to stop the curriculum and actually go back and review something? All of that can be very helpful. But, they're, but summative assessments are not perfect. They're not Swiss army knives that can solve every sort of problem that we put in front of them. So one of the number one issues with summative assessments is, and that we really can't avoid is that because it's an assessment of learning, that means that it's always looking backwards, not forwards. So for example, take something like a final exam, right? Students study for the test and then they take the test and they get a grade, but the test is over. And now they don't really have an opportunity to learn from what they got wrong. There's very little opportunity to learn from mistakes because of that, the test is over, it's done. Also, sometimes we as teachers, we make mistakes. Maybe we sometimes write a test and it's not the most fair exam and student performance isn't even affected uh, because of whether they studied or not, it's affected because we didn't write a very good exam, that can happen too. So how does this affect writing? I would make the case that the summative assessment is not, it's suboptimal for writing. It's not doing what we would like it to do because of its very nature. It's not its, it's, not its fault. It's just, that's the way a summative assessment is. So what do I mean by that? A summative assessment with writing does a couple of things. The first is that it's encouraging student procrastination because as we all know, if we're being honest, students wait till the last second to study for tests. And if you give them a essay on 1984 with a hard deadline, chances are they are waiting until the week of to write that paper. Okay, so they're procrastinating rather than spending the time to edit their papers, look for those mistakes, giving that due diligence to their work. But then another issue and this is something that haunts a lot of teachers is the issue of feedback. Traditionally, right, we as teachers provide students with feedback on their essays because we want them to improve, right? We need that insight. So students need that insight so they know how can I get better? The issue is, remember, a summative assessment is over when it's done. So that means that you as a teacher, right, we've spent all this time writing feedback to help students learn from their mistakes, 
but the assessment's over. So they might learn something from the feedback if they read it, or more likely than not, they leave the classroom, and if they didn't do well on the, on the essay, they throw it right in the trash. And all of that work that we've put into those feed, into that feedback, it goes right into the garbage. And so teachers are becoming aware of this. Tons of studies are out there. They're showing that teachers, because they're realizing that students don't read the feedback, then I'm not going to even write feedback in the first place. Now we have a feedback loop where we're not writing feedback. Students aren't learning from feedback. Students aren't learning how to write better. OK, and that's what we need to be focusing on. How can we fix this? So I would say that we need to be looking at the other type of assessment. It's like the, the younger brother of summative assessment, <laughs> the, the brother that often gets overlooked, and that's formative assessment. So if a summative assessment is a test that is looking backwards, a formative assessment looks forwards, right? It's formation, formative. OK, so it's an assessment for learning instead of of learning. So this is a test that is never really over, okay, which can sound scary, but it's some, it, 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 for example, it could be something like a multi-draft writing assignment. The essay is not just done at a set deadline, right? There is a draft deadline, but the essay still goes on, right? The journey continues. Now, what are the advantages of this type of assessment? There's a couple of them. On the one hand, Formative assessments allow teachers to provide students with timely, which is very key. The sooner we can get students' feedback, the better. They're more likely to learn from it. We can provide timely, relevant, and constructive feedback. And all of that can be true because the students have to read it because the assignment isn't over, right? So unless the student wants to do an exercise in futility where they keep, they never read anything that we tell them, and the, and the assessment continues, right? They're going to have to read it. Otherwise, they're going to keep getting the same grade over and over and over again. Similar to assumative assessment, we can actually use this to monitor student performance over a long period of time. Because again, it's not over. So instead of one data point, you now have multiple data points over perhaps multiple weeks, maybe months, maybe even a year. And studies have shown that formative assessments help improve student engagement with learning material, because again, I know I sound like a broken record, it's not done. They have to continue working with it and learning from it, practice over and over and over again. Now, for those of us that are, have used formative assessments, we already know what the number one problem with them is, and that is time. Formative assess, I would be lying if I didn't say that formative assessments are time consuming for teachers. They absolutely are. Depending on how large your class is and how much feedback you wanna provide, it can be a lot. Personally, when I'm, when I, just this last year, when I was using this in my junior class, I spent 25 hours of my Thanksgiving break providing my students with feedback so that when they got off a break, they had their feedback. That's a lot of time, right? A whole day, right? Writing all this stuff out. Were there times that I didn't want to be doing that? Absolutely. But does it work? It, yes, it does. But we have to recognize it is a lot of work. All right. And so when we're doing that, one of the reasons it can take time is because constructive feedback takes time. We have to really think about what it is that we're writing. So I've provided some examples of what constructive feedback can look like. Right. We're writing comments down, such as the body paragraphs. You need to have your transition sentences. Uh, this is not a thesis. <laughs> what you have is not an argument. We need to work on that. Or one of the things I've noticed a lot is with my students is they use uh, one word numerous times throughout a paper and they don't even realize it, uh, such as uh, this um, all the time. Um, or they're using passive voice, any sort of one of these things. But this is the feedback that can provide students with those directions, those arrows that can help them improve. So to sum this up, Formative assessments can be optimal for writing because they're complementing all of the best practices of writing. We've got multiple drafts. We're revising. We're editing. Students are engaging with constructive criticism. They're not just throwing it in the trash. Also, formative assessments allow, they create the perfect opportunity for students to have one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with their teacher. That, in my experience, that has been the best time when students learn the most because you get to work one-on-one -on -one with them. Again, does it take time? Yes. Is it worth it? 100%. Now, for those of if you're listening, 
um, I provided a real life example of formative assessment uh, from the movie A River Runs Through It from 1992. Uh, there's a video in the keynote that will be available if you'd like to watch it. But the movie is based off of the true story of a man named Norman McLean, who went on to become a very well-respected professor of English literature at the University of Chicago. And basically what the, what the clip shows is um, Norman McLean, when he was younger, his dad walked him through formative assessment. So Norman would write something, his dad would critique it, go back, try it again, do it again, do it again. And once he had done it enough times and he had condensed, he had written in a much more concise way, his dad, the teacher, would give him that positive affirmation, well done, now you get to go enjoy your day <laughs> and have fun as a child, right? Which is very important, right? We need to let our students know when they have written something that is of a high quality, we need to tell them, this is really good, you need to be proud of this. So here is a sample assignment that, uh, that I use um, with my juniors, and I do a variation of this with my seniors. Um, so I actually use a year-long essay assignment, which it's a lot, but I understand that other humanities classes, like my literature classes, the philosophy classes, they're all going to be assigning their own papers. So what I've made the decision to do is I have my students write one paper that they submit multiple drafts over the course of the year um, that they receive feedback on, feedback on. So I want them to get really good at editing this one paper and to see just how just how much they can improve this one paper. Um, so it's kind of like a, a like preparing them for what we would expect them to do if they go on to college. Um, I provide them with written feedback with markings on their on their essays. Um, I also have thrown in a peer correction assignment, which peer correction can work um, if you as the teacher make that effort to ensure that students are not um, like your like students are not grading each other's like their friends essays and then giving each other passing grades or something like that. So you have to make an effort to make sure that it's anonymous and that you've covered all those bases, but peer correction can be helpful. Um, if you want students to be exposed to how their peers are writing or to show them like, okay, like actually my essay is in a very good spot because it's a lot better than this one and vice versa. But one of the critical components of this, of this assignment that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second is I grade each draft as if it's the final draft. Um, now, the short answer to this, and I'll, again, I'll explain a little bit more in a second about why I do this is because I always want to give students an accurate assessment of their work. I never want to be in a position where I feel or somebody tells me that um, I have misled a student, right? We are, we are teachers of students. We need to be honest with them and we need to show them clearly how they can improve for the next draft, okay? Uh, now here is a sample grade rubric that I use. Um, again, it's in the, you know, it's linked in the presentation. So if you'd like to take a closer look at it, you can. Uh, but basically the, the gist of the breakdown is that we have five grades for a reason. Um, so I, I would say we should be using them. Um, and one of, one of my teachers, you know, sh she would always tell me that the C paper is fine, but it's, it's nothing special, right? It, it meets the bare minimum expectations. The B paper is better than the C paper in the sense that it's it, it's got pretty solid logic. It makes good points, but it may not be the most beautiful paper. While the A paper does everything well, it's exemplary. It goes far beyond the minimum expectations. It's got good logic, uh, basically near perfect grammar, um, and it's it's a delight to read. And that makes it an achievement. When students get that A paper, I make an effort to tell them like, you need to realize just how hard what you accomplished is. Like you need to be proud of this, okay? Now, a um, couple other things, expectations for rough drafts. Okay, so there has been, I think, we, we, we as teachers need to do some reframing, I think, of how we present our expectations to students about rough drafts because Students, and if you ask them, they, this is what they assume. When students hear rough draft, basically what they think in their mind is, okay, I can write a bunch of random stuff, or as one of my teachers would call it, word vomit, 
And then I can turn that in and then I'm going to get a good grade because it's a rough draft. Like you can't, you can right? Speaking as a student, like you can't grade it that harshly. We need to reframe this so that students realize we as teachers don't want to see rough drafts because it's, it's a way, it's a waste of time, right? We're not, we, we don't want to see it. We don't want to see papers that have where students are misspelling their own names, right? We don't want to see papers where students have sentence fragments or they haven't, they haven't cited any of their sources or all of the stuff where it's basically just completely incomplete, right? We need to be teaching students that they need to take writing seriously. And the only way we can do that is telling them when you turn in that first draft, I don't even call them rough drafts anymore. I tell them the first draft, it needs to be edited. You need to have looked at it, not written it at 3 a.m., <laughs> right? Similarly with the final draft, that should ideally be the third or fourth draft that the student has submitted. It should have been heavily scrutinized. By this point, students are looking through their papers and they're being really critical, such as how many times do I use infinitive verbs? Can I weed those out and replace them with active verbs? Um, um, am I being selective in my use of vocabulary? Are my sentences concise? Is my rhetoric elegant? Is there a flow to this? That's what we want to be seeing from students when they turn in those final drafts. It is, it's something like an art project. Like it should be something that the student has spent a lot of time on, not again, written the night of. Okay. So how exactly could, the, could we uh, implement this in practice? So I gave a couple of examples here. So with formative assessments. So if, if you're teaching at a lower grade level, obviously we're not, we're going to adjust expectations based on where students are at in the learning process. So we're not, we're not um, using like graduate level um, expectations for students in middle school, right? They're not there yet. So if we're in, let's say elementary school, the lower grade levels, what should we be doing there? Well, we can use formative assessments to help students learn the principles of good grammar and punctuation through consistent practice. And I know this isn't the most fun thing to teach, right? <laughs> Having lessons on commas, we can all think of better things that we would like to be doing, but it's so important because yes, if writing is more art than science, there is still a little bit of science in writing and that is grammar and punctuation. You can't write a good paper if you don't know how to write a coherent sentence. By the time we get to middle school, we're helping students apply the basics of grammar and punctuation by having smaller writing assignments that we can easily provide feedback on at, so then students edit them and then we regrade them. But we should still be reinforcing that grammar and punctuation, okay? And then by the time they get into high school, by this point, they should know what a noun is. They should know what, they should know what the difference between active and passive voice. They should know what contractions are, right? And when to use them and when not to use them. And so then now we're starting to give them longer writing assignments, perhaps multi-draft essays. We're sitting down with them one-on-one. -on -one. And most importantly, we're raising that bar. We're raising expectations, not lowering them, okay? So with all of this, right, I wanted to include a section where, you know, this might sound like the stereotypical history teacher thing, like we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. Well, a lot of these things that I've done, I, I've made some mistakes along the way, and, and I've tried to be very intentional about, okay, what works and what doesn't. So I want to provide you with three pitfalls that I've either done myself or I've seen other people do that have ended in some type of disaster, okay? And so please don't do any of these three things. The first thing, the completion grades. So true story time, okay? Okay. So a couple of years ago, when I was teaching some sophomores, um, I gave them a paper, okay? And they had a first draft. And I was under the mentality at the time, right? First draft, okay, it should get a completion grade because it's not the final draft. And what I didn't realize was that in that moment, I was giving the students what they wanted, which was a good grade, but I wasn't giving them what they needed, which was honest feedback because... When I then graded their final drafts and provided honest feedback, I started receiving all these emails, all these phone calls from reasonably upset students and parents saying, wait a minute, how did my student do so well on this, on this rough draft, but then they got a C on the final draft? 
And it was overwhelming. And that's when I realized that completion grades, whatever the noble intentions that we have, they fundamentally are misleading to students, all right? We have to remember that as adults, we might look at things a different way, but students, when they receive a really good grade for suboptimal effort or, or subpar effort, many of them are then, as I discovered with turnitin.com, many students just would resubmit the first draft as the final draft. Why? Because if they got an A on the first draft, why am I going to change anything for the final draft? Okay, they, they, they interpreted the grade as adequate because they got a high grade. Some students, like best case scenario with completion grades, some of them, they might change something, but it's not going to be enough because they have no idea what they're doing. You didn't, we didn't provide them with the necessary guidance, the feedback on how to improve. And then, right, as, as we're going to see in a second, if, if we do this and then we are honest, it can provoke that outrage, right? And that's when I, I just made it, I, I just incorporated it into my philosophy of education. I am not in the business of misleading students. It, it was not a good situation to be in. So that would be one thing I, I heavily, heavily recommend being just staying clear of completion grades, especially with these types of writing assignments. The second pitfall is similar, and it's the everyone gets an A mentality, okay, which is basically the participation trophy of education, okay? So the issue with the everyone gets an A mentality is that, again, it's encouraging bad writing habits. If, every, if all students are getting A's, regardless of the effort, the people that we're actually hurting the most are those students who genuinely want to learn. The students who have that talent, the ones that are applying the principles of good writing, and yet they're turning in really good papers, but they're getting the same grade as the student who spent two seconds you know, writing a paper at night. It's not a good feeling for those kids. And so now we're punishing the, the students who are actually trying, the ones that are doing what we want them to do, and we're rewarding the students who have now learned that they can turn in subpar effort and get a really good grade, right? Just, and I would say, just because a student then turns something in, that doesn't, ne like, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be A quality, right? It's kind of like if we were to go to the dentist, right? And you were going there for a root canal and then you hear the dentist say, well, I tried, <laughs> right? Oh, did you fix my root canal? right? It's just not how life works. So just because, right, just because that we, you know, we, we could do like, maybe you try, but maybe it wasn't good enough. And if we do try and it was actually good enough, that should be rewarded. And then the third pitfall is giving students too much unsupervised time. So it's no secret, high school students are incredibly busy right? Sometimes when I would think about which is harder, college versus high school, in some ways, college can be easier because we're not in eight classes, boom, 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 you know, right in a row, right? They're doing all sorts of things, not to mention sports. So we've got all these assignments as students, right? And when students are figuring out, okay, what am I going to work on? Most students are fairly logical. They work on the first thing of the highest priority. So if I have the choice between working on a paper that's due in three weeks versus my math homework, which is due tomorrow, the very reasonable student is going to work on the math homework. The problem is when all of these assignments start adding up, that paper keeps getting pushed further and further back. We have procrastination, okay? So now one solution might be, well, why don't we just extend the deadline, right? Just push it further back. It doesn't solve the problem. All it does is it makes students procrastinate for a longer period of time. So the solution that I've found to this is if you want to have those longer term writing assignments, I've started requiring mandatory conferences with students weeks in advance to ensure a couple things. Do you have a draft, right? Are you actually, have you actually written this paper yet? Because I don't, I don't want students editing and writing things at 3 a.m. We all know how that turns out. And have you started editing this paper? Okay, so we have this, this check to ensure that the writing is happening, not just leaving it, leaving them to it, because we all know how that happens, what that works, how that works. So 
Two more sections and we'll be wrapping up. How can teachers then sort of work with each other to help fix this problem? So some of the best practices that I've observed with teachers um, and how we can help students write better. First is collaboration. And this can mean a couple of things. Making sure that especially assessment deadlines are spaced out appropriately. I remember as students, we all thought that teachers got out around a big round table and had some cabal about, okay, how can we assign like seven exams on the same day? And right, students think that, right? Especially when a bunch of assessments all pile up at the same time. We should be working to make sure that that doesn't happen very often. And what we should also be collaborating on is are we grading are we, do we have this, do we have similar expectations for effort? How do we know this? How can we figure this out? Uh, one of my, one of my former, I guess, teachers of teachers, well, the way he taught me was you, you do a grade off. So what you can do is you take a paper and you then both grade, let's say like it's, let's say it's the first page. You both grade the first page and then show each other. Okay. How did, how did we grade this? Is it sim are grading expectations similar or are they a lot different? And then you try to see, okay, how can we meet in the middle? Teachers, we should also be differentiating the purposes of writing assessments. So look, if you want to test student knowledge of a text, do an in-class essay test. There's a summative test right there. If you wanna make sure students read 1984, do an in-class essay test. But if we wanna be helping students learn how to write well, leave that for the out of class essays, those formative assessments, where we can provide those students with that consistent feedback over a long period of time. Lastly, for teachers, we need to be holding students to reasonable high standards, all right? We're moving away from those completion grades, which can mislead students. We have to be providing feedback. I know it is just, it's one of the worst feelings when we believe that students are not listening to what we're telling them. That doesn't mean we should throw in the towel, right? We can't, we can't preemptively give up on our students, right? We have to do everything we can to provide them with those tools to be successful. And that means we can't be compromising on the basic writing principles of good grammar, punctuation, and style, right? If students are turning in essays with a bunch of sentence fragments, they need to know that that is, that is not acceptable. Right. That is that is a sign of an F paper. Right. If you can't even write a complete sentence, we, we have to be honest with them in the most gentle way possible. Right. We want to set them up for success now so that they don't have a crash and burn when they get outside of our school walls. OK. Now, also for parents, how can parents help? The, I have a couple things for all of you that are listening that are parents. Um, the number one most important thing is don't ever forget that as parents, you are your child's first teacher, right? We in the school, we can't replace you, right? You have an impact on your kid that we are not going to have. Like we have an impact on your, on your children too, but we can't replace you. So the more that you are involved to the best of your ability with your child's education, the better that they're going to they're, that they're going to grow up and learn. Okay, so one some things, one some ways that you can be involved. Requiring your child to read first, get screen time later. Okay, a 2023 Gallup poll found that 51 percent of U.S. adolescents, so teenagers, are spending anywhere from four to six hours on every day on social media across five different platforms. What, imagine if that time was not spent right doom scrolling on TikTok, but it was instead right working on their papers and getting better at that level of communication. One of the most important things that you can do: read your child's essays and the feedback that your that your child's teachers provide. So just like my, I mean, my mom did this to me all the time. She would read my essay, she would provide me feedback, and she would read any feedback that my teachers were writing. On my papers because she wanted to make sure right that she was that first line of defense before her before i you know i would submit my paper to my teacher okay it's so helpful the third thing is when teachers are providing one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with students encourage your child to attend those 
that is when the vast majority of learning can happen is when we can provide that relevant feedback to your child. Okay. And then lastly, when you, when you have teachers who are holding your child to high standards, right, we need to resist that urge, right. To go into, right. That the, the mama bear, papa bear protective mode of like, right. Um, I want you to only say good things about my child's essay. If your teacher is, if that teacher is being honest and they're being sincere and they're actually trying to help your child write better, please support us who are, who are trying to do that job and help your child become a better writer, to become a better communicator. And it's, and it's better now that your child learns that submitting hastily written or poorly written papers that's not acceptable. We don't want them to go into the into the into the world outside of school. They get involved in a business and they think that that's totally fine, right? It's better they learn that now than later. Okay. So to summarize, I know it talked about a lot. In summation, a couple of the, the most important key points. R we have to remember that writing is more art than science. Uh, we need to show students that right there isn't just one right way to write a paper, that there are a variety of styles and we can synthesize various things uh, from some of the best writers that have ever lived in the Western tradition. We have to remember that writing is a mirror of the student's mind. So if the student presents a paper that is logically sound, that is coming from a logically sound mind versus a paper that is meandering all over the place and has no rhyme or reason or direction that is suggesting that the student needs more discipline right? So that they can get to that point where they can form a coherent argument. We talked about the differences between summative and formative assessments, how summative assessments have their place, but in terms of writing and helping students become better writers, I believe formative is the way to go. Because again, it is it mimics the learning process and the writing process. I talked about a couple of pitfalls, such as the pitfalls surrounding completion grades, the everyone gets an A mentality, and giving too much unsupervised time. There are certainly more, but those are some of the ones that I've seen the most. Lastly, mentioned that we as teachers can be working together to support each other in helping our students become better writers, and that that mission is so critical and important, we cannot give up on them. And also parents reminding you of your integral role in your child's life as their first teacher, right? being engaged with them, reading their writing, uh, giving them that constructive criticism so that they're receiving it from both you and their teachers can help students acquire that intellectual humility where they can then, right, we can unleash and tap into that student potential to write well, beautifully, persuasively, and concisely. So I wanna just thank you so much for listening to me talk. Um, and talk a little bit about writing. I hope this was helpful. If you have any um, any longer questions that you want to field to me, my email is right there. It is on the screen. It is Zachary Palmer um, at thalesacademy.org. But um, just thank you again for listening to this presentation on writing is rewriting.